In spiritual perspectives, this week at Next, I am currently reviewing a book by the title of Revival. Mostly, the purpose of the review is to take issue with the way the author defines revival and to show that for him, baptism is not a key part of it. Probably one of the greatest revivals in Israel's history occurred after the Israelites returned from captivity, and it took place in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah. Don't think that uh, despite this revival, there were no problems at all. Ezra dealt with one concerning divorce and remarriage in Ezra chapter 9 and 10. And Nehemiah had to deal with some brethren charging interest to their brothers in chapter 5. And then years later, Nehemiah would receive four more problems that he had to deal with in chapter 13. But upon the completion of the wall around the city of Jerusalem, there was a period of what could be called a revival in Israel. And it is described in Nehemiah chapter 8, which we're going to want to be taking a look at this morning. Let's consider some of the characteristics of that revival. First of all, there was unity. The people gathered together as one man, it says in chapter 8, verse 1. We find this same attitude present uh, following the day of Pentecost when the church was established. They were praising God and having a favor with all the people. Uh, They were meeting and fellowshipping one another each day in Acts chapter 2, verse 46. Furthermore, unity is stressed throughout the New Testament as something that is uh, needful for the church. Uh, For example, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1.10 that you should all be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. There ought to be unity among brethren. And uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, Paul provides seven reasons, count them, seven, Uh, for unity in the body of Christ. Uh, There is uh, one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. Seven ones we just noticed in those three verses. Ones, things that cause us to be united together. And so that's a New Testament emphasis as well as we find it being present in uh, the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. But let's now look at the second thing. There was an emphasis upon the Word of God. Unity cannot be established unless it is based on the word of God. The people, remember in uh, verse 1, told Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord commanded Israel. The people told him to bring it. They wanted to hear it. And uh, so... Ezra did precisely as the people had asked. He brought the law before the assembly of men and women and all who could hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. And then he read from it in the open square that was in the front of the water gate from morning until midday. When I throw in the part about standing, you'll probably say, I'm glad we live now. From morning till midday. Uh, And they heard 
the word of God, the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Now, later on, many centuries later, Jesus would pray for the unity of his disciples. Uh, not for these only do I pray, but for all them also who believe on me through their word. But first he prayed that they would be sanctified by truth. And then he adds, God's word is truth. John 17, 17. They all had the same doctrine as the church began. And in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. Revival will not occur unless we are determined to be united on God's word. Now we can't be united on it if we don't know it. We must know the word of God before we can be united on it. We need to know the apostles' doctrine before we can have unity on what it teaches. So those two things are essential to revival. I do not know how revival can occur unless these two things are present. The word of God and unity based on that word. But further, we find that they were resolved to keep that word. Again, in verse 3, the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Ezra and others, we see, also gave the sense of the law uh, so that people could understand. Uh, and the people stood up to hear it when he opened the book in chapter 5. And uh, they blessed the great God. So there were men who gave the sense of what the word was. Why is that necessary? Well, it had been nearly a thousand years since the word was given in the Hebrew language. Sometimes over a period of time, even a short period of time, Words become obsolete. They change their meaning. You uh, might be compelled to snicker a little bit if you're watching a movie made in the 30s or 40s or even the 50s and they talk about having a gay evening. That word has kind of changed from what it used to mean. It was just meaning carefree and happy but now it means something else. So they gave the sense of the meaning of the law. Also, there's always the possibility that traditions had been established, which weren't really what God meant at all. We know some of these existed in Jesus' day because he condemned them in Matthew 15, verses 1 through 9. Perhaps some verses were compared with others to uh, show uh, corroboration or something along those lines. But it is too appropriate to explain the Word of God. That's why we have commentaries. Now, their commentaries were probably better than the ones we have. We have some by a lot of biblical scholars. Sometimes they contain some very interesting and valid insights. And sometimes they miss the mark entirely. So we have to be careful with commentaries. But the idea that you give the sense of a passage goes all the way back hundreds and thousands of years. Also, the Ezra would not skimp and just omit parts of the law. 
He didn't sit down and say, you know, I don't know if people are going to like this part. Maybe I could just skip over that and go to something else. After all, it'll still be the word of God. I'll just leave out some... No, Ezra didn't think that way. People today do, but Ezra did not think that way. He knew that the sum of God's word is truth. Psalm 119 and 160. The sum of it. You need the totality of it. You need all of it. He did not just read from the portions of the law that were positive. He would read it all, including those parts about disobedience and punishment for disobedience. He read it all to the people because they needed to hear it. And not only did they need to hear it, they wanted to hear it. So there was enthusiasm for the reception of the law. To our best knowledge, the people who heard Ezra and others speak from morning till midday did not say, you know, this is really dry. Could we have some dramas to explain some of the teachings? Could we have something to jazz it up a little bit? Maybe an elaborate musical program that'll just put people in awe? No, they did not do that. They read the law. And they stood up to listen, as we mentioned a moment ago. And they worshiped as well, as verse 6 points out. So here we see a love of the truth, a love of God's law. Another element of revival is that of repentance. They were greatly saddened because of their previous sins. Let's pick up with Nehemiah 8 and verse 8. So they read distinctly from the book of the law of God and gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor... Ezra the priest and scribe and the Levites who taught the people said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Continuing, Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites quieted all the people, saying, Be still, for the day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink, to send portions and rejoice greatly, because they understood the words that were declared to them. They understood it. They gave the sin, they read the law, they gave the sense of it, and the people understood it. They did not try to alibi or make excuses. They were actually grieved and saddened by what was read because they had not been doing it. But, of course, as you saw, they were informed this is not a day of grief. This is a day that is holy to the Lord. Also in chapter 9, along these lines, verses 1 and 2, Now on the 24th day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and sackcloth and with dust on their heads. Then those of Israelite lineage separated themselves from all foreigners and they stood and confessed their sins and iniquities of their fathers. So the one day was holy to the Lord, but on another day they fasted and prayed and confessed that they and their fathers had departed from the word. It is godly sorrow that leads people to repent, as we learn in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. There is the sorrow of the world, which does not necessarily bring about repentance. But sorrow, true sorrow, will bring about repentance. 
and the law would provide them a positive direction in which to walk. The next element that we want to mention is that of restoration. The only way to please God when things have gotten far afield from what he revealed, the only way to please God is to restore what he originally commanded them to do. And that's what we read in Nehemiah 8, verses 13 through 18. Now on the second day, the heads of the fathers' houses of all the people with the priests and the Levites were gathered together to Ezra the scribe in order to understand the words of the law, and they found written in the law which the Lord had commanded by Moses that the children of Israel should dwell in booths during the feast of the seventh month. And that they should announce and proclaim in all their cities and in Jerusalem saying, go out uh, to the mountain and bring olive branches, branches of oil trees, myrtle branches, palm branches, and branches of leafy trees to make booths as it is written. And then the people went out and brought them and made themselves booths, each one on the roof of his house or in their courtyards or the courts of the house of God and in the open square of the water gate and in the open square of the gate of Ephraim. So the whole assembly of those who had returned from the captivity made booths and sat under the booths for since the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, and that until that day, the children of Israel had not done so. And there was very great gladness. It was in the law of Moses. They had not practiced it as it was written in the law of Moses. But in order to please God, they reestablished it. They restored the practice that had not been done since the days of Joshua. Also, day by day, from the first day into the last day, he read the book of the law of God, and they kept the feast seven days. And on the eighth day, there was a sacred assembly according to the prescribed manner. When something has been forsaken, when it has been forgotten, when it has been neglected, it needs to be restored if there's going to be any revival that takes place. The only way for the church to be revived today is to restore what was done in the first century, teaching about salvation. We need to have the same teaching. Men have gotten far afield by uh, making up things as sinners' prayers, which are not in the scriptures, and various other ways, such as faith only, and on and on it goes. If we're going to have revival, if we're going to have uh, a restoration, we have to go back to the way it was in the New Testament, as it was on the day of Pentecost and various times following that. People had to believe, have, uh, have that kind of faith that would lead them to repent of their sins, confess Jesus to be the Son of God, and then be baptized in order to have their sins washed away. But also, teaching needs to be restored concerning correct worship. Neither Jesus, nor the apostles, nor any church in the New Testament ever worshiped with instruments of music. If you don't believe that, go find the passage. Find where Jesus did, the apostles did, where the churches in the New Testament used it. There is no mention of it at all, and it is not correct worship. Singing with our voices to praise and honor God is what needs to be restored. And then also it needs to be restored uh, the pattern that God had for leadership in the church. There are qualifications for a group of men called bishops or elders or presbyters, or overseers. They are all the same word, or not the same word, but they are all applying to the same work that is given. 
And one of those is to be married and having children. Somebody that's 17 or 18 years coming to your house saying, I'm an elder, not following the New Testament, are they? That's not what an elder is. There is, not, there is no qualification for the pastor because there is no the pastor in the New Testament. It is always a plurality of men who oversee a congregation. And so that needs to be restored. It's, it's, you can't have revival if the word of God is not restored containing, uh, concerning that. And uh, there's another thing I just heard of, uh, and you'll read about it in about three weeks. Some churches now have a pastoring couple. A pastoring couple, a husband and wife. Where are the qualifications for that in the New Testament? You see how far afield people are getting? Plus, they're an auxiliary of another congregation. Where do you find one congregation being an auxiliary of another in the New Testament? It's simply not found there. God designed the church for every congregation to be independent, self-governing, and to take care of the things that it needs to take care of, not what somebody else needs done. So we need to give attention to all those things. Also, there needs to be sound teaching. There needs to be right attitudes. We need to be engaging in the work God gave the church. And one of the most important things that comes to mind is evangelism. Jesus gave the, four, the Great Commission four different times. Once in Matthew, once in Mark, once in Luke, briefly in John. But the work is to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And of course, uh, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but those who don't believe shall be condemned. We need to give attention to all of those things if the church is to experience revival. Now there are some other principles from Nehemiah chapter 9. The Levites acknowledged God's promises and assurances. They knew that God delivered them out of Egypt. They remembered that. It's part of their history. It's recorded in the book of the law. There are several times where uh, things are summarized, such as in Numbers chapter 1 and Numbers chapter 33. Even the places they stayed in the wilderness are recorded. But certainly their deliverance out of Egypt is a prime subject in the Old Testament. God gave them over to their enemies, however, as he said he would do, if they forsook him. In Leviticus chapter 26 and Numbers chapter 28, or rather Deuteronomy 28, you will find warnings about this occurring. If they follow the law of God, they will be blessed. But if they turn away, if they turn to idolatry, God will punish them and the final act of that is being taken captive. They knew the reality of that. They had been, probably most of these people in Ezra and Nehemiah's day been born in captivity. Uh, or their families knew about captivity. But now they were free and they needed revival to stay free. And thus we find these things written in Nehemiah 8. They had experienced God's justice in captivity. Obedience meant God's blessings. Disobedient meant God's wrath. Is that difficult to understand? Obedience, blessings, disobedience, wrath. I think even school children can understand that, don't you? And yet Israel chose to be disobedient. But now they are eager to please God. And we have a revival underway. 
And God would preserve them in the face of their enemies. So let's talk about some lessons for the church from this particular passage. Some principles that we can apply. Number one, God still keeps his promises. Whether obedience, which merits reward, or disobedience, which merits punishment. In either case, God keeps his promises. Number two, God still wants us to be enthusiastic in learning his word, the truth. We should not pass up opportunities to study the Bible, such as on a Sunday morning Bible class or Wednesday night Bible class or a Thursday night class for ladies or a Tuesday every other Tuesday class for women or a one day lectureship. We should be present if we want to prove our enthusiasm. You don't prove enthusiasm by saying, eh, I don't know if I'll go or not. Nobody's going to catch enthusiasm that way, are they? It's the idea that we're studying the Word of God. We need to know the Word of God in order to be pleasing to Him so we will be enthusiastically studying that Word. Number three, we must commit ourselves to unity. I could give you a long list of divisions between brethren over the years. Why aren't we committed to unity? Yes, sometimes division has to occur if somebody is preaching something that is false or leading in the wrong way. But many times, some of these could have been avoided if we would have just gotten together and tried to work the problem out. We have to be committed to unity. Number four, we should repent of past neglect. We've all probably been guilty of being neglectful at times, maybe not consistently, hopefully not. But at various times, we may have had our faith weakened. We may have not had that same level of commitment. We should repent of past neglect like Israel did. Number five, we should rediscover the privilege of being God's children. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. The apostle writes, <clears throat> Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope, purifies himself as he is pure. It's a privilege to be called the children of God, a son or daughter of God. We need that if we're going to experience revival. Number six, we should be eager to please God. You know how children are. Sometimes Christian children are the same way. You need to clean up your room. Oh, do I have to? Yeah. And smile while you're doing it too, please. But we're kind of the same way. Do I have to? Yeah. Hebrews 10.25 still says not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Yeah, the things that God gives us are for our own good. We shouldn't be, have to be dragged kicking and screaming against our will to do what he says. We ought to be eager to please God. And number seven, God rewards obedience and punishes disobedience. That hasn't changed. There are 
many awesome passages in the New Testament that point out that even for Christians, and I know some say, oh, oh some, once you're saved, you can't lose it. You're always saved. But that's not what the New Testament teaches. The New Testament has the writer saying to Christians to be obedient and then adds, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Don't think that we'll escape just because we've obeyed the gospel. Not if we haven't remained faithful. Not if we haven't been interested in restoration. Not if we haven't been eager to please God. We need all of those things. This morning, if you haven't obeyed the gospel, you can't be called a child of God in the sense that those who have obeyed can be. In one sense, we're all children of God because he created us. But there's a special sense in which we're children of God if we have obeyed the gospel. Have you repented of your sins? Have you been baptized for the forgiveness of your sins? You can do so or discuss it with us. We'll be glad to uh, show what the scriptures teach on this subject. Or if you're already a child of God, have you fallen away from the interest, the excitement, the enrichment, the blessings of being a child of God? Have you appreciated those and been enthusiastic about those? Perhaps you need to have a revival of your own. If we can help in any way, let us know while we stand and while we sing.